ladies and gentlemen, uh, I always like to start lectures with an anecdote from my Heidelberg days, where I was uh, assistant professor from 2009 to 2012, when I was informed that a German lecture would normally start with an apology, whereas an English lecture would start with a joke. Uh, whatever to think of that, as someone who had previously been socialized academically in Vienna, I inevitably uh, had to perceive, though not a strict, but a certain deviation from my home country, where one also likes to start with words of thanks. I would now like to follow this tradition and begin, begin by thanking the directors of the Kete Hamburger Kollege, Ulrike Ludwig and Peter Östmann, most sincerely for granting me the first research professorship at the college. Unfortunately, time passes more quickly than one would like, and one would have liked to spend more time together, uh, to have exchanged more, even though the current situation makes many things difficult in this direction. Be that as it may, I'm still enjoying my sabbatical at the college and uh, hope to be able to give you a little insight into my research today. The detailed papyrological and legal historical work I'm confronting you with may be dry at one point or another, but I really want to use my time here to bring you close to the papyri the source genre that has not let me go since I was a student. I give my lecture in English for sure, but especially in lectures concerning legal papyrology, I am always confronted with the problem that the research tradition is so strongly influenced by non-English literature that an adequate translation of the facts into English is sometimes no small challenge for me. So now I hope you can follow me well, and I would like to start my lecture with a few general remarks on the time of the severance, which will occupy us in the following. Under the rule of the Severan emperors between the years 193 and 235 CE, the Roman Empire underwent profound changes at various levels of the political system, the effects of which often only came to light in the course of the third century CE. For example, the preferential treatment of the military and the Constitutio Antoniniana, the granting of the Roman citizen citizenship to all free residents of the empire by Caracalla in the year 2012 whose copy has been preserved on a fragmentary papyrus from the Severan period. All these tendencies had lasting consequences for the Roman Empire. The Severan period accelerated many developments which had already begun to appear in the second century CE and so established the foundations of the late antique state from the fourth century CE onwards. Jurisprudence also received strong encouragement under the Severan emperors. Literature dealing with legal matters flourished for a final time. The Severan jurists Papinian, Ulpian and Polus were the most significant representatives of jurisprudence in the late classical era. These jurists produced a new genre of law texts on the duties of various officials with such works as the books about the office of the uh, proconsul, of the prefectus urbi, and of the prefectus vigilum. Their aim was to explain the sphere of authority of certain officials and thus to facilitate their work. This objective corresponds with the tendency to systematize administration of the state, a particular concern of Septimius Severus. 
Septimius Severus, the first emperor of the Severan dynasty, was also deeply involved in judging cases, a quality praised by Cassius Dio in his Roman history. He stated, quote, then he, Septimius Severus, would hold court unless there were some great festival. Moreover, he used to do this most excellently for he allowed the litigants plenty of time and he gave us his advisors full liberty to speak. He used to hear cases until noon." Uh, end of quote. Furthermore, many constitutions are documented under the name of Septimius Severus in the Codex Justinianus, which is part of the Corpus Juris Civilis, a collective designation of the sixth century emperor Justinian's codification of the Roman law. Moreover, the paparol paparological evidence provides us with a much more intimate insight into the emperor's legislative activity in severan times. The origins of this fortunate circumstance are Septimius Severus and his sons Caracalla stay in Alexandria from December 199 until April 200 CE. In the wake of this, I would call it event, many documents bear vivid witness to the emperor's efforts in jurisdiction, and we will learn about them in the course of this lecture. Among the relevant documents, most, impref most impressive is certainly the Papyrus P. Call 6123, to whose comprehensive edition the entire volume P. Call 6, published in 1954, is dedicated. This papyrus is a transcript uh, of 13 imperial rulings, the so called Apocrymata. The papyrus is probably a memorandum made by a legal consultant by his own hand and for his own use. This paper aims at contextualizing this memorandum in the wider circle of manuscript parallels. By discussing the legal and social implications of these documents, a nuanced light uh, can be shed on the consequence of the av availability of collections like this papyrus and the work of legal consultants. This will allow us to directly understand how legal collections were composed and processed for everyday use. Such insights are unique for the ancient world and owed, owed slowly to the papyrus evidence from the Severan period. The place of origin uh, of the papyrus P. Call 6123 is associated with the village Teptunis in the Arsinoite Nome, an administrative district in Middle Egypt equivalent to the Fayum Oasis region. The papyrus has 60 lines and reproduces 13 rescripts uh, uh, that Septimius Severus and Caracalla issued in Alexandria. As you all know, the capital of the province of Egypt on three consecutive days, more precisely from the 14th until the 16th of March in 200 CE. The first 13 lines, including three uh, rescripts, read as follows. In Alexandria, copies of Apocrymata posted in the Stoa of the gymnasium, year 8, Famenote 18. Imperator Caesar Lucius Septimius Severus, Pius Pertinax Arabicus Adiabenicus uh, Particus Maximus Augustus and Imperator Caesar Marcus Aurelius Antoninus Augustus to Ulpius Heraclanus, also called Callinicus. We revoked penalties imposed upon Alexandrians or Egyptians when we assigned a definite time of remission. Lines six to eight. To Atemidoros, also called Achilles, having placed yourself in agreement with the decisions 
rendered, too late you take umbrage at the judgments given. Lines 9 to 11. To the Aurelii, Artemidoros, and, and Anubion, and others, comply with the options rendered. Line 12 to 13, end of quote. Accordingly, the textual example testifies a pardon, lines 6 to 8, a belated appeal, lines 9 to 11, and a request to comply with a court order, lines 12 to 13. The arrangement of the entries shows that the altogether 13 rescripts are not linked to each other in terms of content. To refer to the copied rescripts as apocrymata, answers, in Latin, responsa, is based on the heading of the text, where it says in line two, antigrapha apocrymaton, copies of the answers. The rulings in question are classified by modern research as subscriptiones, literally signatures, a term taken from judicial terminology as they all display the formal, the formal characteristics of this type of uh, decisions by the emperor. In these short notices placed below a submitted petition, the name of the emperor is immediately followed by the name of the addressed petitioner, followed by a succinctly formulated decision and the annotation, rescripti, I have signed, or recognovi, I have verified. This image of a petition from the third century may give you an impression where we would expect a subscriptio on the document. Namely, as I said, below the petitioner's narrative in this section. In this case, a petition to the Prefectus Aegypti or governor of Egypt, to which we will come back later, we find the, fourth, the, the short subscriptio here followed by the Latin annotation Recognovi. We find it here. That means that um, the Apocrymata Papyrus uh, seems to have been a compilation of individual subscriptiones that were originally found on petitions. Except for the annotation rescripti or recognovi, all mentioned elements of an emperor's subscriptio, subscriptio are included in the conception of P. Col 6123. The name of the emperors, Caracal, uh, Septimius Severus and Caracalla, which in our case are mentioned representative for the whole document only once in lines uh, two to four. Yeah. The name of each petitioner, according to which each individual entry is arranged. You see here. Each, each petitioner, petitioner, and subsequently the decision itself followed after the petitioners. In lines two to three, also representative for the whole document, these information are supplemented by the reference to the public display of the subscriptiones. This is common practice with citations of subscriptiones because after they have been subscribed by the addressee, the petitions were publicly posted so that the petitioners could read the subscriptiones related to them. According to lines two to three of our papyrus, in our case, the original subscriptiones were posted in the stoa of the gym gymnasium in uh, Alexandria, where they were free, accessible to the public for reading and drafting. Normally, the term subscriptio subscriptiones would be translated into Greek as hypographai or antigraphai. That the papyrus labels these subscriptiones as apocrymata 
apparently served to ideally valorize the judicial verdict received from the emperor. This, at least, is the argument put forward in a recent study of the Apocrymata. According to it, the intention was to transform the standardized and almost anonymous handling of the petition into a personal face-to-face -face conversation. This would mean that the word apocrypha could not be regarded as a technical judicial term. Picol 6123 was written by a professional scribe who used many literatures. The name and titles of the emperors seem to have been added later by the same copyist in a crowded style with smaller letters in the free space after the date in line three and before the first apocrypha. Um, here you see the titles of the emperors. The ductus in this passage also stands out in that it appears to be thicker than in the rest of the document. The writing in line one here shares this characteristic so that the heading in Alexandria could also have been added later in the upper margin of the papyrus. The indicated additions tend to argue against classifying the uh, Apocrymata papyrus as an official copy uh, for public use in archives. In this case, one would furthermore expect the document to be uh, designed as a scroll, as this was the usual form in which data or information was archived for longer term at that time. However, the former, the format of our papyrus suggests a single sheet which is in fact what we see. Uh, and there is no indication of the existence of other columns. Thus, the Apocrymata papyrus is likely to be the product of a professional scribe who made a copy for his own use on a single sheet, including revisions to complete the draft. Apart from this papyrus, the judicial activity by the severance is demonstrated by a significant number of further papyri. The texts, which are of interest here, were mainly produced during the reign of the severance and demonstrate, like this papyri, a towering interest in collecting and processing the severan emperor's law. A brief discussion of the relevant manuscripts will give us an idea of their function and the craft of legal consultants. The material can roughly be classified into two text groups. Both groups are com composed of documents containing copies of severe legal rules. The difference between the two groups is that on the papyri of the first group, we find only copies of legal rules, whereas on the papyri of the second group, these are, these copies are part of a petition. Uh, let me take a closer look at both groups. When dealing with group one, one can distinguish three subgroups. Firstly, there are copies of single apocrymata, like uh, uh, the apocrymata papyrus, whereby the extent of the respective copied apocrymata is much smaller in this group with a maximum of three apocrymata or copied apocrymata per papyrus, as in the case of the papy papyrus you can see now. A second category of copies of severe um, rulings are pieces without any connection to the apocrymata. Some of them are related to the stay uh, of the emperors in Egypt, Septimius Severus and Caracalla in 199 and 200, and Caracalla again in 2000, uh, in, in two, sorry, in 215, while others uh, have a different context, uh, context. Thirdly, a further and particularly 
interesting ca category is represented by compilations of decisions on specific legal questions, uh, in the context of which, in addition to apocrimata, recourse was also made to other legal decisions. Accordingly, this papyrus, P. Oxy, um, 644435, of which I can only show you an image of lines 1 to 14, contains a collection of at least six responses concerning the topic in integrum restitutio, a reinstallment into the former legal position, issued in various forms. Alongside, and you can follow this, alongside an excerpt from the so-called Gnomon Code of Regulation, not investigated so far, of Septimius Severus and Caracalla, lines one to six, and the source named as ex itimaton Alexandreion, meaning from the petitions of the Alexandrians, lines seven to 12, a chapter from the Lex Letoria, the Letorian law, uh, lines um, uh, 17 to 20 and 21 to 22. Uh, sorry, uh, a chapter from the Lex Letoria, lines 13 to 14, a subscriptio that cannot be clearly identified, lines 14 to 16, and two apocrymata. And here we are uh, at lines uh, 17 to 20 and 21 to 22 are cited. Another compilation can be found in the papyrus P. Strass 122, where legal rules concerning the topic longi temporis prescriptio, an institution applied to provincial land which could not be occupied under the civil law, are documented. They contain one apocrypha, lines one to nine, and two decisions of the governors of Egypt, one of Supatianus Aquila from the year. 207 lines 10 to 24, uh, and the other of Matthew Sophus from the year 90 lines 25 to 33. In this context, P. Windop G23027, a newly discovered papyrus from the Vienna collection, edited by me during my fellowship at the Kate Hamburger College, is also of interest. And I would like to take a few minutes to introduce the text to you. Due to the entire layout of the papyrus, it can only be an excerpt from a collection of legal rules of the emperors, you might expect it, Septimius Severus and Caracalla. Kephalion mu alpha in line two here indicates that what follows corresponds to the 41st chapter of a work related to these two emperors. The blank space after Sebaston in line six here, um, and the indented writing of lines seven to 10. Leave no doubt that the actual content of the, 30, uh, of the 41st chapter was reproduced at this point. So the citation starts here. Even if this cannot be reconstructed exactly, the parallels clearly indicate that a legal rule was copied here. Consequently, this must have an inner connection to the aforementioned emperors, Septimius Severus and Caracalla from which collection this um, 41st chapter recorded on our papyrus was taken must remain open. That the template was a compilation of the apocrymata cannot be excluded. However, the copied text on our papyrus would have to be a new testimony in this respect, since none of these apocrymata has become known so far, which would fit the textual remains in line seven to 10. Overall, the extant textual passages offer no concrete clues to determine more precisely the content or form 
in which the copied legal rule was enacted. Despite all the uncertainties, however, the comparative brevity of the legal rule could still suggest that it was an rescript or an uh, apocrypha. In line two, one reads after the indication for the first chapter, three letters here. Um, namely, Alpha, P, and Omicron. Before the lacoon, yeah, I had a joke, but uh, I won't make it now. Omicron, yes, okay. Before the lacuna starts, Kephalion, uh, Mu, Alpha, uh, Apo. This Apo, uh, could only theoretically indicate uh, a connection between the uh, 41st chapter and our apocrymata. For how the construction was continued is questionable in principle. In light of comparative passages, one would actually expect kephalion to be followed by the uh, preposition ek, after which reference is made to the underlying source. That the preposition apo was also used instead of ek, ek uh, in this context has not been attested so far. To continue the, con the construction with the addition apokrimaton uh, would be linguistically unattractive because of the absence of a preposition following kephalion. Such a resolution should therefore be reframed from, in my opinion, at least if one wishes to see in the uh, in the apocrymata, the designation for the source or the collective work from which the uh, 41st chapter was taken. A final possibility, possibility would be to think of a construction like you see it here, um, uh, uh, like uh, kephalion, mu alpha, apocrymaton, ek, followed by the indication of the source collective work. In this case, too, the quoted passage would be associated with legal sentences that were designated as apocrymata. However, these would then themselves have been taken from a superior collective work. In any case, the reference kephalion mu alpha should be emphasized. It indicates uh, the ex exact location of the section within the collective work consulted for the research. In this way, our papyrus provides the first indication of a collection of severe legal rules in which these were indexed in the form of individual num uh, numbered kephalaya chapters. In the parallels, kephalayon had not yet appeared in connection with an exact, with an exact citation. This compilation of rulings, which was used as a template for the drafting of uh, our papyrus, may have been more elaborate and systematic than the Apocrymata papyrus. It may also have contained a wider range of entries and thus not have been limited to rescripts or Apocrymata. The paratextual remark in line one here, consisting only of the indication of the number five represented by the letter epsilon, is likely to refer to the fact that the entire excerpt was assigned the number five. This suggests that the present papyrus in its original state had several columns which with similar entries. Thus, we have before us the excerpt from a collection of legal sentences, which was itself part of a compilation of legal rules. So here we could expect further columns. What the, ex what the exact purpose of this compilation was and along what thematic lines it was oriented remains obscure. Let us now come to the second group of texts important for our investigation. As already mentioned before, this group contains petitions, 
with quotations from Siberian rulings. In general, petitions were intended to be submitted by private persons to emperors or Roman officials who were asked for help in legal cases. And you have already seen how the addressees informed the petitioners of the further course of action, namely by subscriptiones, by which the petitioners uh, uh, could also be invited to a hearing or to court. Now, the characteristic of the petitions we are interested in is not simply that they contain quotations, rather they are prefaced uh, with quotations. It is quite possible that some uh, fragments assigned to the first text group, the mere compilations of legal rules, were the broken parts of such a petition. As far as can be ascertained, the cited rulings in the petitions mostly represent quotations from apocrymata, which are combined with other legal propositions where appropriate. Currently, there are a total of 12 petitions fashioned in this particular way, seven of which are addressed to the prefectus Egypti or governor of Egypt, four to the strategos, the highest ranking known official of Egypt, and one to an official whose designation is lost. To give you uh, a sense of the shaping and structure of these petitions, let me give you a few examples. I want to start with a papyrus you have already seen. It belongs to the specifically fashion petitions which are of interest here. We are dealing with a petition from the Middle Egyptian Heracleopolite Nome to an unknown governor of Egypt. And I would like to take this papyrus for which I have published a new edition as an opportunity to give you a more precise idea of the content and layout of, of uh, a petition. The document begins in lines one, two, three, here, with a Latin quotation of an almost completely lost imperial constitution. In lines four to five follows the so-called inscriptio, the address, with the naming of the addressed governor of Egypt, whose name is lost in the lacuna, and the sender or petitioner, a veteran named Elias Surion. This is followed in line uh, five to nine by the so-called exordium, the beginning. Here, the petitioner, the veteran Elias Surion, refers to constitutions from which it would appear that only the governor could be considered as judge for the case presented. Lines 9 to 26 belong to the narratio, the narration. The petitioner Elias Surion reports that he is a resident of the Heracleopolite Nome and lives from fieldwork as well as from the savings from donativa, money gifts, and stipendia pay accumulated, uh, accumulated during his military service. After he had given loans in kind, composed of weeds, uh, of wheat and vegetable seeds to some, to some at most seven persons from Heracleopolis, the capital of the Heracleopolite Nome, and had them issue certificates, i.e. promissory bills for his own security, he had become the victim of a robbery by his debtors. The debtors apparently questioned the existing debt relationship. Surian complained that his debtors had acted unlawfully, violating the law that forbid insulting or beating veterans. This narratio is followed in lines 26 to 32 by the so-called preces, the petitioner's request. Once again, Surian invokes the, consti uh, the constitutions that would have forced him to make this petition with detailed descriptions of the offense. In order to prevent his accused debtors from taking action against him, with the support of the strategos or other instances, he asks the governor of Egypt 
uh, as the judge responsible for the accusations made for a hearing. We have already met line 35. In addition to the date, it, con it contains on the one hand, the subscriptio with which the governor of Egypt complies with Surian's request and grants him an audience or hearing. And on the other hand, the control note recognovi. Finally, in the last line, there is a registry note. It indicates the place where the petition can be found in the scroll deposited in the governor's archives. As petitioner then, we encounter here a veteran whose business activities, incidentally, we can trace from other documents from the first half of the third century, thus from severe times. He bemoans an injustice or injuria office, uh, offense committed against him by uh, several people and requests a hearing in front of the governor, which is eventually granted. If such descriptions of injuria offenses in petitions are anything but unusual, the section preserved at the head of the document in lines one, two, three, represents a peculiarity. For usually petitions start either with the inscriptio or if it is an authenticated copy of the petition already subscribed by the governor with the notice about the lawful copy. That petitions were introduced, introduced with quotations of legal rules is absolutely unusual before the Severian period which will be discussed in more detail later. What is still to be pointed out in connection with, the, with this petition is that the quotation in lines one to three is in Latin. This is an, this is an absolutely unique case uh, because otherwise legal rules in petitions from Greek or Roman Egypt are quoted in Greek, just as the rest of the petitions were written in Greek without exception. Let me now briefly discuss four further examples of petitions with preceding transcripts of legal rules in order to round off the picture of this text group. The Papyrus P. Oxy um, 47, uh, 3364, contains a petition from the Middle Egyptian uh, Oxyrin Shad Nome, addressed to the governor of Egypt, Subatianus Aquila, dating from the year 209. Two constitutions by Septimius Severus and Caracalla are at the beginning of the document. They are probably not to be included in the group of apocrymata, since in line 34, they are called diatagmata which points to edicts. The two constitutions were passed in Alexandria. One includes the threat of punishment for those harboring taxpayers from a different gnome, uh, lines one to six, while the other concerns a request to travel to one's place of birth or idea, lines six to nine. Following that is written, uh, following that is a written communication of the governor, Subatianus Aquila, to the highest ranking gnome officials, the Strategoi, which since it includes a reference to the emperor's constitutions, probably also orders the return of taxpayers to one's place of birth. The gnome authorities had uh, the task to see to the publication of Aquila's order, orders in their area of competence. The petition proper starts here in line uh, 23. After the constitution quoted above, it is hardly surprising that the petitioner deplores the illegal stay of a wrongdoer in the Oxyrinchite gnome. He requests that the governor of Egypt or the direct superior of the Stratikos of the Oxyrinchite gnome, the Epistratikos, 
to enforce, enforce the punishment. The papyrus P. Oxy uh, 674593 also contains a petition from the Oxyrinchiat Gnome and is once again addressed to Supozianus Aquila. The petition is introduced by the quotation of uh, an apocrypha, which was not posted in Alexandria, but in Memphis, in the portico of the famous Serapeion, lines one to four. The legal clause concerns the simultaneous nomination of two compulsory public services or liturgies, uh, which was forbidden by Septimius Severus and Caracalla. In accordance with the content of the Apocrypha, the petitioner complains that the unlawful nomination to two liturgies had happened to him. Um, in the case of P. Oxy um, um, 734961, we are dealing with an authenticated copy of a petition. On the papyrus sheet, the text of the petition is written in duplicate. So one is running until here and the other duplicate runs from here. The petition itself is addressed to the governor of Egypt, Marcus Edinius Julianus. It concerns a dispute over assets between the female petitioner and her father and later her stepmother, which had already been heard in court. Following the notice about the lawful copy of the posted petition here, three legal rules are quoted. The, the last is clearly identifiable as an edict because of the introductory phrase kai ecteo diatagmatos in line 42. It is stated that parents and children are permitted to take action if they feel they have been treated unjustly. The first legal rule reproduces a rescript, perhaps an apocrypha of Septimius Severus and Caracalla also found in another papyrus and states that there is no prejudicium, prejudice, if the petitioner has lied. After this legal rule, a subscriptio by the governor of Egypt, Mecius Letus, is cited, which makes concealing the truth in a petition a wrong and thus thematically ties in with the preceding injunction. The legal rules quoted fit well with what is reported, namely a dispute between daughter and father or stepmother, uh, in the course of which the father had already filed two petitions against his daughter. Finally, I would like to refer to the papyrus P. Oxy um, 644437. It contains a petition to the Stratikos of the Oxyrinchite gnome from the years 229 to 235. The apocrypha quoted in the lines 1 to 10 deals with cessio bonorum, i.e. transfer of property. In this case, in order to avoid a compulsory public service or liturgy, the conscripted person, according to Septimius Severus and Caracalla, could pass his possessions to the person who had nominated him. This person would then have to carry out the liturgy. Against the background of this legal principle, the petitioner reports that he had been nominated by a money tax collector, uh, collector at his successor. Although the actual request in the petition has been lost, we can assume that the person nominated did not want uh, to carry out the liturgy. What conclusions can be drawn from this evidence? First of all, it must be stated as already anticipated um, that the practice of citing the relevant legal, legal rules at the beginning of a petition constitutes a new development. The years 
199 or 200 when Septimius Severus and Caracalla developed their legislative process in Alexandria are the most likely terminus postquem for this practice. None of our petitions predates the year 199 or 200, which also applies to the thematically arranged collections of different types of legal uh, uh, rules dealt with above. The most recent securely dated petition um, uh, or, or specifically fashioned petition uh, with quotations at the top of the document is from the year 236, 237. Therefore, at the most two years after the assassination of the last emperor from the Severan dynasty. Thus, it is certain that our specifically fashioned petitions went out of style quite quickly after the Severan dynasty. If we categorize the issues addressed in the petitions, it is striking that all the petitions addressed to the Strategoi concern the Cessio Bonorum and predominantly aim at exemption from a compulsory public, public service or liturgy. In contrast, petitions to the governor of Egypt show a wider range of content. They concern the denunciation of a malfactor, a will, a dispute over assets, as well as a dispute uh, uh, in the context of compulsory public services or liturgies. On the one hand, the unlawful simultaneous summoning uh, to two litur liturgies, as well as on the other hand, the burdening of a person who is too old. The different weighting of the issues observed should not be overestimated since the whole bunch of petitions addressed to the Strategoi were not limited to the aforementioned areas, but were just as broad in subject matters. This leads to the important observation that in addition to petitions with quotations of legal rules at the beginning of the documents, there were of course petitions that were not drawn up in this way. The last one were even in the majority among the petitions which can be dated to the Severan era or the early third century CE um, and were addressed to the governor of Egypt or the Stratikos because our 12 specifically fashioned petitions are opposed to 28 normal exemplars without introduction uh, introductory quotations. If we consider each addressee separately, the following result can be observed. Regarding petitions addressed to the governor, seven specifically fashioned pieces are opposed to six normal ones. And regarding petitions addressed to the strategos, four specifically fashioned pieces are opposed by 23 normal ones. This general picture continues in the concrete. For example, if we consider the group to which numerically most of our petitions are to be assigned, namely the petitions con concerning liturgical matters, we find among the five addressed to the governor of Egypt, three normally designed and two that show the characteristics focused uh, on here. The ratio is similar for petitions addressed to the strategos on liturgical matters. Of a total of seven petitions, there are allotted, uh, three are allotted to exemplars at the beginning of which legal sentences were cited. This makes clear, first of all, that the use of these specifically fashioned petitions was a marginal phenomenon, mostly documented in the context of petitions to the governor. Moreover, it should be noted that the quotation of legal decisions was, was not systematic, i.e. it is not to be expected that the quotation 
will be given if an appropriate decision exists for the case. This can be shown by PSI 121243. This petition is addressed to the Strategos and complains the unjust nomination to two compulsory public services or liturgies at the same time. There was an apocrypha dealing with this is issue. However, it is not quoted in PSI 121243. Therefore, the quoting of legal rules at the head of a petition to strengthen its legal claim was certainly not obligatory. Possibly, this practice will be more due to the personal uh, initiative of the petitioner, writer, or legal consultant in the writing offices. Uh, in this direction, point three, P oxy texts. These petitions are addressed to the same strategos of the Oxyrinchite gnome, deal with the same issue and start with the citation of the same ruling. Against this background, it would be possible to assume that the petitions were written in one and the same writing office or under the guidance of one and the same legal consultant. It would then appear obvious if the petitions had been drafted in a writing office in Oxyrinthios, the gnome of uh, the uh, the gnome capital, the gnome capital of the Oxyrinthia gnome, and uh, the official residence of the Strategos. By placing the emperor's decision at the head uh, of uh, of the petition, the intention was, without any doubt, to emphasize its legal claim and to impress the addressee. Ob obviously, preferably the governor of Egypt. The fact that judgments in other cases were referred in this way to serve as a frame of reference for decision-making by the addressee can only be demonstrated on the basis of the petitions preserved on papyrus. What is demonstrated here is then the direct and practical application of the severe emperor's law issued in Egypt. It is true that imp imperial constitutions were occasionally referred to in petitions to strengthen legal claims also in the second century, but the severe material documents a much greater quantity and variety. Based on the diversity of the papyrological documents, um, um, based on the diversity of the papyrological papyro evidence, the reception of imperial legal rules in petitions seems to be a characteristic of the severe era. This also applies to the preparation of copies of imperial legal rules without direct reference to a petition, because as we have seen, parallel to the specifically fashioned petitions, the compilation of uh, apocrymata in B call 6123 and thematic collections of legal decisions are also found in the papyrus documents. This evidence leads to the conclusion that the jurisdiction of the severance has left considerably, uh, considerably more traces in the papyri dating from the first to the third century CE than that of other emperors. Against this background, it is surprising that although research has dealt with the apocrymata of Septimius Severus and Caracalla in terms of terminological and legal issues, far less attention has been paid to the practical contexts of other, uh, to the practical contexts of other compilations and petitions or the place of these documents in legal history. It is precisely in this respect that my paper breaks new ground as it suggests that legal decisions were used in a standardized way. Indeed, the material allows us to discern three levels in the processing of the emperor's law. First, it is the collecting and summarizing of the imperial rulings in one manuscript. This 
level is represented by the Apocrymata papyrus, where, as demonstrated at the beginning of the lecture, the Apocrymata of Septimius Severus and Caracalla were co copied chronologically by date, but not thematically. A more differentiated compilation may be suggested by the uh, indication uh, Kephalion mu alpha, which is preserved on our Viennese papyrus. This ghost compilation may also have been more elaborate than the Apocrymata papyrus. Second is the compilation of documents collected according to topics uh, with individual legal rulings on definite legal queries. The examples discussed before deal with a collection of responses concerning the topic in integrum restitutio, a collection concerning the, to the topic longi temporis prescriptio, and probably our Viennese papyrus. These compilations require direct access to collections such as the Apocrymata papyrus or the anonymous compilation of rulings used as a, a template for the drafting of the Viennese papyrus from which the relevant legal rulings could be copied. The, th the third level concerns manipulation of legal rulings in petitions by citing them at the top of the documents. Here, the petitioner relies on the practical application of the emperor's law to serve as support for his own legal claim and thus positively influence the decision-making of the official addressed. It is, by all, it is by all means feasible that some of the compilations according to topics were produced to support a petitioner's case. The clear uh, categorization uh, of the types of documents combined with the quantity of material suggests very strongly that the almost casual handling of compilations of constitutions was common practice in the Severan period. Based on the Apocrymata papyrus, this practice does not seem to be due to the efforts uh, of a systematic bureaucracy seeking to facilitate the consumption of legal sources for the inhabitants uh, of the provinces, but to the initiative of legal consultants. They are arguably behind the group of people who produced and used compilations such as the Apocrymata Papyrus and the other compilations we met. In view of this, we are dealing with persons skilled in writing and with a strong interest in legal issues and who may have been educated in law. In their role as legal consultants, they collected imperial rulings and arranged legal sentences by subject. In doing so, they, pos uh, they possibly also made use of official legal compilations that were publicly accessible in archives. Apparently, they also offered legal assistance to petitioners, uh, which consisted of collecting the relevant quotes of judgments, of judgments needed to improve the argumentative force of the petition. With the documents of the time of the severance, we can thus uh, uniquely, tr uniquely trace the activities of early legal practitioners, that is something like local jurists uh, drafting legal texts by their own hand and for their own use. Exact references to the emperor's law are a discontinued model in the papyri of the post severan era. One reason might be that for Egypt, there was no direct point of contact with the emperor's legislation under the subsequent soldier emperors. Moreover, the regimes changed several times until Diocletian's take over in 284. The emperor's ro role as a judge certainly fell to some extent victim to the crisis of the third century. 
appealing to severe and low, might also have lost its attraction in the time of the soldier emperors, as the ideological connection to the regime in power at the time was missing. Thus, with the apocrymata of the severance and their various attestations in the papyri, we can get a unique insight into the individual preparation of judicial sources for a broad circle of users. In this context, the work of legal consultants reflects a, devel a development which had become increasingly important for jurisprudence in the second century, namely uh, the sorting and collecting of the emperor's law, which had been compiled from mandata, edicts and epistles uh, to mag magistrates, as well as rescripts on matters pertaining to trials. Through their practical treatment of the law, the legal consultants allow us to trace at the local or individual level what became a general necessity above all over the third century. For when the abundant communication and scholarly treatment of the consultants uh, of the constitutions had died out with the judicial literature of the late classical period, Papinian, Ulpian, Polos, Modestine, the need for independent documentation of the emperor's law was bound to become even more urgent. In late antiquity, this desideratum was finally met on a broad scale with attempts of codification culminating most prominently in the Codex Theodosianus and Justinianus. And I'm eager to further investigate if with the help of our papyri, we can uncover the first attempts to collect, organize and systematically treat the multitude of imperial laws and thus uncover the roots of the new post-classical approach to Roman law. Thank you very much. <laughs>